In this episode of Investors and Operators, I am sitting down with John Hewn, who is the founder and managing partner of Compass Group Equity Partners. The reason why you should listen to this episode and watch this and take notes is really simple. If you care about fundraising, especially for first-time funds, we're going to dive deep into that. Uh, If you want to learn about how uh, Compass thinks about Uh, operating the firm with their mission, their values, the operating frameworks. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to dive a little into into John's uh, backstory uh, growing up and and maybe how his story as an engineer affected his view of private equity. So John, uh, would like to turn it over to you for an intro to the firm. Uh, Instead of 60 seconds, I might say 51 seconds purely for branding. We're St. Louis based uh, and we're looking for businesses that really fit four criteria. The first is that it's thematically focused. The second is that it's in mid-America. We call it mid-America. You might call it Midwest. It's an area that we know and we resonate well with. So between the mountain ranges is where we're hunting for businesses. And then we're looking for founder-led businesses. We're always the first time institutional capital. And we're looking for those individuals to roll over with us and become really a partner uh, with us. So not hand us the keys and walk away. And then, of course, they've got to fit the size and scope of what we're looking for, which is uh, two to 15 million in EBITDA. You know, of course, good, good margin, good financial results. So we built that up. We have a team of about 20 people. Uh, we started as an independent sponsor, uh, did that for about seven years, and uh, we're now investing out of our fund two as a more traditional private equity fund uh, of 255 million. So, so far so good. And on that fund two of 255, when did you raise it? How long did it take for you to raise? Yeah, we were very fortunate. We, we did a lot of planning and we kicked that off in the fall of 21 and uh, had our final close in the uh, spring of 22. So just about a year ago, and it took us uh, just about six months to raise the fund. So a lot of pre-planning to be able to get it done that fast. Cool. Well, let's let's dive into some fundraising topics. And uh, in the next section, I want to talk about some stuff that's related to the, the founders out there, the management teams out there who might be uh, considering how to transition. But let's first start around fundraising and really have a discussion that's focused on the independent sponsors, the emerging managers, Yeah, we we were very fortunate uh, in the process and it it worked very well for us. We had a lot of things that were in place. As a result of that, I think we had a successful uh, outcome. We had a team because of our independent sponsor days. We we had multiple exits already. We had a a business under LOI uh, and then closed for the fund. We had a pipeline of opportunities. So we were able to check a lot of those boxes. Our goal in that particular uh, fundraise was to get our name out there in advance. Uh, So that's why we were late in the year and then focused on our first close in January of 22. And then our uh, we moved very quickly to our our final close um, in March of 22. What kind of pre-marketing activities were, were you doing to kind of warm people up? We did a little bit of a whisper campaign over the summer and fall, a little bit that this uh, this great firm called Compass Group that uh, you know had been around quite a while, very successful uh, independent sponsor, so that when we got uh, ready to go, um, we had some people who had already, already raised their hands and said, yeah, we're interested in, uh, in that. We did decide to hire a placement agent, Aqueduct, um, to help us with that process. You know, I think that's always a question for folks. So do we do we do that or not? You know, they're not cheap. Uh, any of the, the placement agents, there's a cost to that. But we were fortunate that we could run the firm and had been running the firm based on management fees from the existing portfolio. So yeah. it wasn't as if we needed those management fees from the fund to, you know, staff the organization or uh, rent an office or, or those types of things. So we were able to do a lot of that prep work in advance and, and get ready to go. In a strange way, COVID actually helped us. And I've said this multiple times to people, I can't imagine those uh, w- wonderful road warriors that went out there and went city to city, knocking on doors, having meetings. Yeah. And COVID taught a lot of the, the LPs of the world, the allocators, that you can do this 
over Zoom. Just as we're doing right now over Zoom, and it allowed us to really get a lot more done in a compressed period of time. Well, that kind of brings up two questions. One, you know, maybe not specific to Aqueduct, but just ballpark, how much do placement agents cost? How much do emerging managers need to think about or independent sponsors? Yeah, I, I would say the general or the average in the industry is uh, about 2% uh, of the capital raised. And um, are you paying we like were, retainers on a monthly basis and that's credited? Yeah, oftentimes retainer of some sort, you know, sometimes they'll work with you uh, on that. Uh, over time, uh, oftentimes they'll, you know, take that fee over time. So if you raise a hundred million dollars and there's a two million dollar fee, uh, it's hard to hand that over right away. But it, it, many of them will spread it out over the next, you know, a uh, few years to mm. to help uh, manage that because you're going to be getting a management fee in over a few years as well. So there's a lot of flexibility there, and I think uh, the, the placement agents understand that they have to work that way. We were fortunate that we were able to bring over $100 million of our fund ourselves. So that mm. saved us a little bit on those fees. And so most of them recognize that they only get those fees uh, on the capital that they introduce. Okay. On on your first meetings, who would you have on those calls? We had, of course, our materials pulled together and we had you know, a nice picture of all the members of the team in our materials. So they knew there was a team. And we did it both ways. And what we evolved to over time is that usually it would just be one or two of us, myself or Chris and I, uh, my partner Chris uh, and I, doing that first call because it gave us a reason to have a second call. Would you like to meet more of the team? Let's get some of the other team members on. Let let you hear their stories. Talk about some of the portfolio companies. So it was another nice next step as opposed to let let, let you meet the whole team and make yeah. the decision based on one call. Talk about the, the first call or the first meetings. Um, what prep did you do before those meetings typically? And then in the meetings, how did you kind of run them? Yeah, so of course we learned and evolved over time on this. Uh, you know, it was our first time. We didn't know what we were doing. So we would just get out there and tell our story. And, and that usually worked pretty well. And, and we think we were a, a little bit differentiated. I learned the, the phrase Jambog, just another middle market private equity firm or buyout group. And we didn't want to be that. So we had to make sure we were communicating our story and where we fit into the you know, entrepreneurial ecosystem um, when it comes to private equity as well. So we would start that call. We would, of course, do a little background homework, make sure we understood who we were talking to, where they were in their organization and, and what that organization uh, did. Did you but typically all, know how well allocated they were or were not to buy yeah. out industrials? Yeah. So so very quickly, we learned that what we should do first on those calls <laughs> is, is ask, why don't you tell us a little bit about your program? And they would say, hey, we have X billion of dollars and we we allocated this way and we're trying to do A, B, and C. But do you yeah. have room for us? Yeah. How, how big is your check size? Uh, what are you looking for? Which, of course, allows you to adapt a little bit of your communication when you respond to them. If they say, hey, we're only looking for X, Y, or Z, yeah. don't talk to them about A, B, or C. So talk yeah. about X, Y, and Z. So we learned a lot of that. But what we learned also is that we were a little bit broad early on. We, we just said, hey, anybody who will listen to our story, we're just going out there to fundraise. We'll talk to anybody. And nothing is more frustrating to, you know, being, being 45 minutes into a conversation and realize that they only that invest way. with, uh, you know, managers that have funds over a certain size and a certain experience that we didn't have. And they want check sizes that are bigger than what we were looking for. So just wasn't a fit. But that's part of the process. You got to, as I say, you got to kiss a lot of frogs to find the right ones. So what tools did you use, whether it's Pitchbook or whatever, to kind of get the, the background research or did Aqueduct provide all that on the LPAC? Yeah, Aqueduct did a great job for us, uh, you know, providing a little background, who these people are, what their backgrounds are, where they came from. Uh, so that was helpful. Um, of course, we would do uh, any research we could if we could go to a website and, and dig in there a little bit. Sometimes the online tools gave us a little insight as well. What we also found is that the, the strategy changes. You know, right now, one of the big dynamics in the industry is, is what uh, they're calling the denominator effect, right? Private equity has performed very well, where some of the public markets have come down. And as a result, they have to rebalance their portfolio. So what was true a year ago or two years ago may not be true today. And therefore, we have to 
um, kind of listen and learn what's fresh in their mind and, and where they are. When we were fundraising, the common story was, hey, really interesting, but we have so many re-ups from prior managers that we're, we're really out of capital. We just don't have room to add any more. And which of course is frustrating. I, I tried the pitch a few times. Well, how good do we have to be before we can displace somebody you already have? But um, you know, capital allocators want to get the best opportunities for their fund, but they're also balancing uh, the people they know and, and trust and have demonstrated with the risk of somebody new. What are some of the key lessons from those first meetings? And then let's talk about what the subsequent meetings look like and how to keep the momentum going. The first meetings, again, we, we would jump in. We were excited, right? So we'd jump in and tell our story and get too far down the road. And as I mentioned, we learned in those first meetings that we had to understand them and their business first. Mm. You know, then whether we adapt our, our narrative a little bit to, to fit their scenario or just recognize what their uh, program looks like and, and what their interest is makes us a little bit more knowledgeable when we present what we're doing. So I think there's a piece of, uh, of that in there. We're all human beings, right? So there's a ton of variation. Some folks are very focused on us as individuals and what makes us unique and why we're special and, and wanting to hear our backstory and, and uh, upbringing and all those types of things. And other people in the first five minutes would want to jump into the portfolio and what we have and how many exits we've had and what our numbers look like which is a necessary way for them to screen, right? You know, uh, we think we're special, but we're probably the, the fourth call of the day and, and they have a stack of books on their desk, uh, uh, you know, pretty deep. I respect all that, but, you know, you resonate better with certain individuals. And, and I think uh, the partners that we're looking for also understand that we're human beings and trying to do some things a little bit differently as well. And so that gave us the chance to, over time, perhaps adjust the type of individuals we're looking for, what we could do differently, how we could research them, making sure that the size and scope of their program fits what we're doing, things of that nature. We ran into a, a, a ton of ESG challenges. And when I say challenges, primarily state or university pension funds um, have massive mandates to shift their portfolio of investment to a certain level of it. ESG compliance. And while we have ES ESG programs that we work with, with all of our portfolio, we had to get better about what we were doing, but we were never strong enough to drag their portfolio up the ESG curve. And some of them were very honest with us that if we didn't, if we weren't a nine out of 10 on an ESG program, they couldn't add us because their average was a two out of 10 and they had a goal to drag everything to the right. So, That's a really good question or point yeah. on the ESG component. And is it to what level is there standardization among LPs of here are the categories, here's how we score, or is it individualized? And what are those categories? For us, ESG is a journey, right? We meet our portfolio companies wherever they are, and we try to take stock of where they where they are as far as ESG programs, whether that be the more traditional. Are you recycling your scrap or minimizing waste and, and using sustainable energy or things like that on the E side? The, the S side, whether that be diversity and inclusion and other areas, you know, how, how are you doing there? And then governance for us comes pretty naturally. I think as a business transitions from independent into a private equity portfolio, there's naturally a lot better governance. You add reporting and KPIs and audits and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, and so we would try to establish where they are, set a benchmark essentially. And from that benchmark, move, try to move them to up, up the channel or up, upstream. And everyone's in a different spot and we just consider it a journey. It's not like you can check a box and solve that. It's to assess where you are and continue to improve or one of our values be better over time. Yeah. Did you have a slide in your deck dedicated to ESG? We didn't when we started. We've added uh, some ESG materials to what, what we do. But again, it's very interesting to me that even today, there is not a very well-defined ESG standard. Yeah. There's no de facto standard that you can say, yes, you know, we, we subscribe to X, Y, or Z. 
you know, we're working to try to make sure that we explain how we do it. And I think in most cases, as long as you have a program and you have a plan and how you're handling it, that's sufficient because it's quite rare. Uh, it's quite common for every LP to ask about it. It's quite rare for them to be able to enunciate what they're expecting from that. I think that's a really good topic to ask for us to be asking both placement agents as well as you know LPs and just getting that out there. Um, so at least it starts to get that such more more public. That's right. Um, af- after the first meeting, walk me through like the the rest of the journey. You know, is there a how did you keep the momentum going? Was it okay within forty eight hours? I'm going to send a follow up that addressed three three points, and then we're going to have a calendar reminder that one month later or whatever. Like how many meetings? Walk us through the process after that first meeting. Yeah happens in the coming months? You know, obviously, just like any sales process, uh, at the end of the first meeting, you're, you're questioning each other, is this a fit? Does this make sense? And, and in some cases, we might get the answer is, hey, thanks very much. I don't know that this is a fit for us because we're looking for, you know, uh, not an emerging manager and we're looking for fund sizes of a certain scope or that are in a certain industry that we don't fit. And if that's the case, we say, thanks very much. We'll keep you in mind. Um, we, of course, record all that in a CRM system and send the appropriate thank you note just to, to be friendly and appropriate. Um, for those who say, hey, yeah, this is interesting. Let's, let's uh, move forward. The challenge was always uh, how to get that next uh, call. And so, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, having a team um, and saying, hey, why don't you, we have another call and you can meet my partner or meet some of the others on the team if they had a interest in talking about our portfolio. It's a great opportunity to say, why don't we have another call and talk about the portfolio? Um, The materials we would share the first time was uh, typically pretty concise, you know, 12 to 15 slides. We try to keep it short so that we could then offer, hey, we have a bunch of additional information on the portfolio and case studies and performance statistics and, and details of what we've done with these portfolio companies or what areas of of research we're we're looking into. And that usually is intriguing for somebody who's serious. So you could get them additional information and and then work to schedule a call to discuss it. Let's talk, I think you hit on a really interesting point on the the size of the deck because 12 to 15 slides, I'm thinking of some of our clients on the marketing side who are raising a first time fund, they're at like 25 to 50 slides of let me show, you know, let me just get all the data into it. And I think what's super interesting in what you're saying is like, less is more. The goal is not to sign the check in the first meeting. The goal is to say, are you interested in the big picture of what we're doing here? That's right. And so our first uh, deck was all about the strategy. And, and you know, there's four areas that I mentioned that, that we're focused on. It was that we had a dedicated business development team with the uh, with Stu and Jonathan, we had a number of businesses that were in our pipeline that we were already talking to. So it was always um, uh, candy to try to say, you want a little bit more. It wasn't the performance statistics. Of course, we had uh, yeah, to give them an overview. Track record. Yeah, we had a track record. And, and uh, of course, the team was in there. So they knew we had a team and with a diverse set of backgrounds that uh, have been working together for a while. So you gave them enough information to say, hey, I like this story, but you tried to have a conversation, not a presentation. And, you know, if you get to 50 slides and you got 45 minutes, you're you're flipping slides and reading bullet points, which is not, you know, going to be very cohesive or, or, or beneficial to a next call. And so we just try to give them enough information to say that's really interesting, because the other thing that happens quite often is you're talking to a screener, right? Nothing's wrong with those yeah. who are at the associate or the VP level, but you might not be talking to the the director uh, level or the CIO in the first call. So oftentimes uh, we would you know, have that first call and they'd say, huh, this is interesting. Let me see if we can schedule another time. And the next call, you can tell if you're progressing because you might have the next level up uh, in the organization on the call and and you eventually need to get to the decision maker, of course. Well, the, you know, that in, in terms of fundraising strategy, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot is like, how do you use video to peak interest and preserve your message so you don't, yeah. it doesn't get lost within the telephone game? 
you know, and should you have like one core video that's like call it 60 to 90 seconds, that's the, the teaser that they can send internally. And then also what are the subsequent videos? So like what we've been doing with, I'm thinking of one client now, every time they're hiring a new principal or an associate, we're getting the two minute bio video, put on Zoom, add graphics, and then we're sending that out to LPs because that gives them a reason to drip out stuff week at, you know, every other week or once a month because team is core. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, like any uh, marketing, which you're very familiar with, it's frequency and repeat to try to get these individuals to keep you top of mind because they're having another call with another middle market buyout firm, you know, the next hour or the next day. And so, yes, all those things that allowed uh, us to stay in touch, which include having an exit, include signing a new LOI, an update on a team member, uh, perhaps uh, a thesis uh, narrative that we're working on, any type of news that we could get in front of them was pretty instrumental. And, and then if you're assuming you're making progress in your fundraise, even uh, announcing your first close that you've raised a certain number of dollars, um, if they will allow you some some brand name LPs that you know said, hey, and oftentimes they'll say, hey, I don't want you to advertise using my names, but if you're talking with another firm, you can mention that we're committed. And, and so that helps to say, yeah, uh, we've got momentum, we have commitments, uh, all those types of things really help. And I'll tell you what really helped the most, it made our uh, our placement agent a little bit nervous, but you know, we've been raising money on a deal by deal basis for, for half a decade. And as a result of that, you just kind of, as they say, fake it till you make it, right? Yeah. And anyone said, how's it going? It's going great. We got a lot of interest. We're moving okay. forward, you know, all those types of things. And then we got to the point where we were really thinking we could get pretty close to closing it out. And we wanted to start saying, you know, we're going to have our final close. We, we thought it was going to be a second close, but we were saying we're going to have a final close. And that quickly moved us into the scarcity mindset that if you want to be involved in this fund, and apparently things were moving along pretty well, you need to make make a decision pretty soon to get, you know, get off your button and say yes or no. And as a result of that, we ended up with more than we could take and put us in a whole different mindset where we could rejigger what our criteria was. You know, our first goal was simply to raise the fund. Once we knew we could raise the fund, it was, do we have the right uh, mix of LPs from the right blend of, of backgrounds, you know, insurance companies, pensions, family office, fund of funds, endowments, et cetera. We wanted a blend of those things. And then we could actually be choosy about who did we connect with? Who do we think would be a good partner going forward? Who would be in our next fund, in our next fund, um, you know, those types of things. And once we got there, we were able to just uh, call the herd a little bit and, and be choosy about who we wanted in the fund. And that gave uh, almost a little bit of a competition of scarcity. And, and unfortunately, we had to disappoint some folks, either cut them back in the amount that we allocated to them, or in some cases, just say, sorry, we don't have room for you in the fund. So on this part, like, I kind of wrap up this part around fundraising for emerging managers and particularly raising first time fund. Um, you know, what, what's kind of the summary of advice, especially in a, in a tough fundraising environment? So I, I would always say go for it, but if you want to be successful when you go for it, you know, have a team, have a pipeline, have a, a deal. If you can have an exit, have a deal under LOI or a deal warehoused ready to be put into the fund. All those things take away the uncertainty for a first time or emerging manager. So if you think about it, an LP's biggest fear is the J curve. Great. You just committed a, a bunch of money. Now I got to go find a team. I got to find an office. I got to set up some furniture. I got to begin the effort to go find opportunities. They could be a year down the road or more, and you haven't done your first deal yet. And that's their biggest concern because that J curve, of course, hurts their marks when they're they're showing the, their uh, LPs on um, their results. So if you can alleviate that concern by saying we have a team already, we have an office already, 
We have a pipeline of opportunities. They're gonna to wanna to see who you're talking to, what kind of businesses. And of course, the uh, the best part of that, uh, the piece de resistance is to have one under LOI or have one bought already in warehouse. Now they know what you're gonna do. They know how you're gonna do it. And that J curve goes away pretty quick. Um, I think that's probably the biggest lesson learned. Now, it's not always that you have all the box checked, but if you can check seven or eight of the 10, as a, you know, that's great. Eight or nine of the 10 is better. But if you go out there with, you know, one or two of the 10 uh, checked, it's going to just be a harder fundraise, no doubt. So let's kind of talk over more about Compass and the, and the firm. Um, some of our clients have used EOS as a framework. Uh, another client has like their own management system that they built out with QHP Capital. Do you have an operating framework or like an engineering system for how you add value and operate companies? Yeah, some people would suggest that my engineering kind of background kicks in here because I want everything to be pretty uh, mapped out and detailed. So I am a fan of EOS. In fact, when we find businesses who who have entrepreneurial backgrounds and, and use that system, we know it's going to be well run. You know, they're going to know what their priorities are and, and what their KPIs are and what they're measuring. So uh, love the system. We, we don't use it at Compass Group uh, exactly, but we do have what we call the playbook. And our playbook is the path or the system that we take our portfolio companies through uh, when we meet them. And it's, it's not a secret during the courting phase. We'll tell them, here's what we want to do together. We'll show them their score or the playbook progress as we're working with them. So uh, it's it's not a secret at all, but it does give a little bit of, of regiment or a checklist uh, like a pilot uh, would have a checklist to work through so you don't forget anything. And it has four major sections. The first section is communications. So in communication, we make sure we're setting up what's the rhythm or cadence of communication? How do we learn about good things and bad things when they happen in the business? What does reporting look like? Um, what are the right KPIs? How do we work together on a weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis? So all that kind of gets set up early on in the relationship. The second category is people, which is a real common component for us. It's quite common for us to be partners with the CEO that's selling the business going forward. But it's also quite common for him to need or her to need to augment the management team, whether that be a head of sales or operations or, or a CFO. So where, where do we need to augment this team to get it to the next level of commercial success? And we work on, on sourcing that key talent together, as well as implementing incentive programs and making sure there's the proper a value creation model that rewards individuals for the success and, and, and the value we, we will create together. So the people sides cat uh, section two, then we have strategy. It's quite interesting to me that many of these businesses have a very good understanding of the business, the leadership does, but they don't have a written strategy of what's their market, how do they win uh, in, the, in the marketplace, what are the products and services or the profile of the typical company, customer? What geography do they want to play in? So we get all that out on the table. And of course, that leads to some tactics of how we build and grow the business uh, together. And then the fourth category is operations, as you might uh, imagine, you know, and that goes back to the KPIs and how do we implement technology? How do we improve operational efficiency and enhance margins, et cetera? And, and maybe the implementation of an ESG program, all that uh, kind of fits into the operations category. Cool. And so we work to build the company over our whole period in all these categories. And when we feel like we've turned a lot of those boxes from red to yellow to green, it's also an indication to us that maybe we've done what we can to grow and build that company. Of these in the playbook, what do they start with? to start getting the ball rolling to be ready to be sold or to be yeah. ready to take an outside partner? Where do they start? Jordan, that's a great question. I uh, hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, those are the categories that not only should they be thinking about, right? You can always improve your company to create more value at the time of a sale, but those are the categories that I think you should ask about and understand 
when a company maybe is courting you to become an investment or a partner, you know, how are we going to communicate and how are we going to work together once we're, once we're together? What do you expect out of the curtain people? And do I have a role or are you going to parachute your team in here? Or, or how does that work? And, you know, of course, strategy, are we aligned in how we're going to build and grow this business and then operations? There's a lot of bad reputation for private equity out there. And I think most of that comes from the 80s and 90s where mega deals uh, were, were done and then cutting heads and consolidation, you know, and those are the movies and the, the books you read. But yeah. the truth is in the lower middle market, 90% of the work we do is to build and grow a business, invest in it, hire more people, expand. And sometimes you have to overcome that. But going back to your question, I think if a company considers what creates value for them, they can improve that. And you know, maybe that's a slightly different list for us, which would include what's your customer concentration and do you have recurring revenue or is it project-based and how strong is your management team and how diverse is your customer base? You know, what do your margins look like and are they growing? Uh, how big is your market? All those types of things um, sometimes are very simply modified by recognizing where a weakness is and a lot of small, using customer concentration as an example, a lot of small businesses have customers that love them and they keep giving them more business. That's great example of how they're performing. But if you have, you know, 40% of your business with one customer, that's going to be a little bit of a, a black mark when it comes to evaluation of your business. So sellers or uh, management teams should think through the depth of these particular key accounts. Oh, like it's a, it's one customer, but we're across five divisions that we've had for the past 10 years. Yeah, how to position that. Or it could be as simple as uh, being very proud that they have 90% or that might be aggressive. They have 60% of the market share for their services in their market, which is impressive. That must mean they're doing a great job. But then you have to make that market bigger, right? The total addressable market, if you own 60% of it, a buyer is not going to feel like they can grow it. So yep. do you grow that by offering additional products to your current customers or taking your current products to new customers and new geography? How do you position yourself to demonstrate you've got growth opportunity yeah. as well? So a lot of investment bankers can help you know, tick down the list of things that a buyer will want. You can do a lot of that work in positioning the business in advance. So let's turn this potentially into a call of action for the management teams out there who might or might not be exploring outside investment or selling the business. At your next board meeting or team meeting next week, next month, next quarter, if they only had to focus on one of those four major sections, what would they start with? It may be uh, natural, but I'd say strategy. Again, people will say, how'd you get here? Well, I was taking care of this customer and this product, and then they asked me to do this. And so we added that service. And and then it's hard for them to enunciate how they win. It's, it's really about being able to tell your story, what makes you unique or different. The way we at Compass Group work is we, we are thematic. So we want to try to understand an industry and we want to know all the players in that industry or subsector, yeah. not just the one that a banker or a broker has available for sale. Yeah. And if we've done our homework and we understand all of them, we want to understand why a business is, is different. They may be underperforming, but we know everyone in the industry performs at a certain level. So there's room for improvement or they may be overperforming because they have a certain technology or a certain business model that allows them to do it differently. And so understanding all that for us is a, a key. And if they can't enunciate that, that here's who we are, here's the profile of what we do, here's our business model, here's where the growth opportunities lie, that, that just kind of documented written strategy really helps set somebody apart from the average company. Let's talk about maybe you know, some of the successes. And I think that uh, on one of your previous podcasts, You'd mentioned like in your first eight deals with 100% IRR and six, six times cash on cash. So clearly a lot's going right. <laughs> uh, but I'm wondering if like thinking through that, like what are some of these big, maybe a case study about how you grow companies? Is there a particular one, I don't know, SunPro or something else that's really you know, front of mind about, hey, this is exactly how our playbook works and what 
success can look like. Yeah. So happy to use Semtro as a, as a, a case study because it was a phenomenal story and it's a phenomenal team. So if, if we back up and say, how did we get to Semtro? It was that we had a thesis in renewable energy. All right. So that's not rocket science. It wasn't unique to us. A lot of people have talked about renewable energy. But our question was, how can we invest in the renewable energy space? That was kind of a macro trend. And five years ago, when we started that effort, it wasn't quite as hot as it is today, but it certainly was a macro trend. So we looked into that and we looked at all the renewable energy outlets that we could find from wind and solar and hydropower to geothermal, um, even nuclear. And it wasn't that we were going to uh, you know, necessarily do those, but how could we invest? Is it in the supply chain? Which of those uh, sources do we think we're going to win over time, et cetera? And as you might imagine, solar really had the winning uh, trends when we analyzed that a little bit deeper. So we went from renewable energy to solar. Within solar, we looked at uh, residential, we looked at commercial, industrial, and utility scale. And as you might imagine, utility scale was kind of high finance and big projects that didn't fit private equity very well. Commercial and industrial was interesting, but had some flaws in how those projects were uh, purchased. You, you might be the tenant in a building and want solar, but you don't own the building. And so then you have an owner that's different than the tenant. And so we lean towards uh, residential. We like that market. And when we got further into residential solar, there's both a lease model and a loan model. A lease model is that the company owns the equipment that's installed on the home and leases it to the, the homeowner. And the loan model is like buying a car. We'll help you finance the equipment that goes on your uh, home. And we like that model because that allowed us to essentially sell uh, instead of a utility payment, you have a loan payment for your for solar system. So it's about a watch. And of course, then you control your energy and own your uh, solar system over time. So I guess I tell you all that because we went from renewable energy to now we have our thesis figured out, which we wanted to find businesses that sold solar energy systems to residential homes using the loan model. So we got that specific. We made a list of 75 of them, probably talked to 20 or more of them. And when I say talk to, you know, signed NDAs and looked at their financials. So we really understood the landscape of the business. Our goal at the time was to put multiple pieces together, which is a pretty common strategy. And with that, you have scale and advertising and scale and purchasing and financing, et cetera. But along the way, we found SunPro, which was proprietary, you know, wrote a letter, made a phone call, and they were growing like a weed, but needing uh, uh, investment capital. And we formed a partnership with them, pulled uh, a deal together, and SunPro continued to grow and double uh, year over year for, for several years. What was a hundred plus million dollar business, now a billion dollar business over uh, uh, several years. So tremendous story, but, and I'd say some of that is luck, but yeah. we made that investment under a different administration before the ITC was renewed. You know, there was a lot of things that weren't so great about solar when we made the investment, but we were convicted because we knew we had found the right space, the right business model, and knew uh, where it was, was going to go. And of course, many of those things came true. Very excited about it and uh, ended up with a, a wonderful exit at a re relatively short period of time. But during our ownership period, we ran the playbook. So uh, Mark Jones, who uh, was the CEO, phenomenal guy, great leader, um, had a commitment to continue to add to the management team. So again and again, you can imagine the type of team that ran a $100 million company was different than the type of team and the expertise yeah, needed company. to run a half a billion dollar company. So he continued with us to add and invest in the management team. We put a clear strategy together. We enhanced the technology uh, that they had in place, uh, assured that they had all the foundational systems uh, and implemented NetSuite and fully utilized it. What markets were we going to grow to? You know, all those types of things working hand in hand. It was a, truly a team effort. Great relationship with Mark uh, to this day. And uh, we're really impressed with what he and they accomplished. Yeah. And we also feel pretty strongly that we were 
part of helping get that done because we were essentially an augmented team when they were in hyper growth mode. Maybe kind of shifted a little bit. What's your why for doing this? Why do you, why do you do what you do? I get fired up when I see businesses yeah. grow. I'm a, a believer in American capitalism. There's no doubt. And there's, there's no doubt that what we do has financial rewards, not just for us, but also financial rewards for the individuals who we work with. It's quite common that you know our purchase of a business is, is uh, making somebody wealthy and allowing them to realize the fruits of their labor and, and their dream of building a business. But then when we get involved, it's oftentimes that you know the management, which could include a handful of individuals or it could include dozens of individuals, now participate in the business from an equity perspective going forward. So we build and grow that business. And it, it, you know they, they are wonderful stories to hear people say, hey, our exit together allowed me to put my kids through college or pay off my home or, or do things that they never imagined they'd be able to do, or just growing the business. We, we have lots of stories where individuals were hourly employee that grew into a management position, that grew into a leadership position that allowed them to achieve a professional career that yeah. they never expected to achieve. And so we joke that we're not smart enough to do that in big businesses, but we've been around the block long enough that if we can take a lower middle market business, so we say we buy businesses that are two to 15 million in EBITDA. Yeah. Uh, so generally single digit EBITDA at single digit multiples. And if we grow them to double digit EBITDA and, and get double digit multiples for them, the numbers work out pretty well. But yeah. we have a real pride and enjoyment in helping build and grow businesses to allow people to achieve life goals that they never thought they'd achieve before. Well, we, we talked a lot about like the successes and the upside, but I'm Maybe for my personal journey, I know I've learned a lot from my mistakes. <laughs> and I, I'm like, should I have learned this many mistakes by 38 years old? <laughs> um, this should be spread out over a lifetime. But I'm curious, maybe some of the, you know, just genuine mistakes that you've made in your career, maybe the ones that are like painful, but it's like looking back on it, this was actually what needed to happen. And, I, and you're better because of it. Yeah, it's interesting. Born and raised here in St. Louis. St. Louis is not necessarily the entrepreneurial hotbed of America at the time. I think it's certainly grown in that area. A lot of innovation going on now. But I tell you that because I was an entrepreneurial guy coming out of college and, and started you know, a dozen or more businesses, a majority of which failed, including uh, one that went into bankruptcy. And I had personally guaranteed the loan for that business. So th there's some true painful uh, experiences. but what you see maybe uh, out in San Francisco more than you see in St. Louis is that those who have failed learned the hard way. You know, I sometimes say, I don't necessarily want to back the individual who happened to start a business and got lucky and was successful as a result. Those who struggled and failed and learned along the way are the ones that are probably better off to invest with uh, going down the road. So Learned a lot of things, what to do uh, wrong, uh, how to how to invest, how to manage the right amount of accelerating growth, but making sure you're watching your cash, you know, all those types of things. But business um, activity uh, in the private equity space requires repetition. And if you have somebody seen one deal or two deals, they just haven't seen enough where you see somebody coming out of private equity or, uh, or investment banking or lending, where they've seen a lot of deals, that is very helpful in the private equity world because of course, everyone's unique and different. Uh, certainly I'm not necessarily proud of my failures, but uh, I think the key phrase that I try to use a lot is you gotta persist and gone through those difficult times. I've been able to tell sellers, I've been in your shoes. I've, I've been in a business that's successful. I've been in a business that struggled. I've had the emotion of selling a business that I owned and built and how does it feel to work for somebody else? And so having that background and experience, I think helps us, you know, connect with and, and uh, resonate with some of those potential sellers. Yeah. And we've all had mistakes and you learn from them. You know, when I, I don't know if it was 2014, but early on in my uh, leadership career, if you call it that, uh, during the entrepreneurial days, I, I made a personal commitment that I was going to treat everyone fairly 
and that I wasn't going to play favorites or, you know, give one person A and somebody else B. And what I learned in a huge failure early on is that we are all unique individuals. And what's important to person A is very different than what's important to person B. So you do have to treat them differently. One might want recognition. One might be embarrassed by recognition. One might want new challenges um, and be left alone. Somebody else might want a little bit of mentoring and help um, so that, you know, we have to truly understand each other to, to work as a team. And so we spend a lot of time as a team here and with our companies assessing ourselves and understanding what motivates and drives us so that we can work together and, and deliver that. My team knows that I'm a strategy guy and I'm not a detail guy. If you read my emails, they often have typos because I don't take the time to proofread them. And I can tell myself a dozen times I need to do a better job of that. But my team knows they better proofread my work before it goes out the door because I'm not the one who covered it. So it it's those, yeah, it's those types of things. Uh, we use this tool called Strength Finders, and I'm an activator um, in, in their vernacular. And activators just get things going. They don't necessarily figure it all out. They just spur it to get going. And and that's real common around here. I, you know, I'm perhaps a little ADD. Activator is another is a better way to say the good idea. For you. Uh, the, that's that's a, the idea a, of the maybe week. Maybe that's just how they're looking at me. They're like, comes up with the great ideas, but how we can get it done. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, I work to make sure we have a team balance with people with great ideas, but also people who can get it done. So um, it's, it's all part of what I learned growing up uh, a little bit is that it, it, my mistake uh, probably as a, as a leader or a business person is it takes different types of people. Uh, you know, I can't stand uh, the detail oriented people who, you know, if I say it looks like about, you know, $70 million and they say, no, it's uh, 68 million, 900 and I'm like, whatever, close <laughs> enough. But we need those people to be precise as well. I was wondering if you could leave the audience with uh, maybe a particular book that has influenced you or a quote or something that has really kind of stuck with you throughout the years. Interesting. I do read a lot of books. I think that sometimes feeds my idea of the month uh, uh, problem. So I try to avoid uh, uh, that. And, and really, I try to let it bake a little bit more. So one of the things that has come up multiple times recently that I've been using a lot in the last five years is a phrase that I learned, uh, which is uh, learn, earn, and then return. So, you know, and the concept there is that when you're in your 20s and 30s, it's time to be in sponge mode, learn all you can, be the best, soak up and become skilled in your unique area. And then in your 30s and 40s, you'll be rewarded and paid for that expertise. And that's your time to earn and make it happen and, and build your career. And then once you've done that, hopefully you're in a position where you can start to return. And whether that be return in the business environment and be a mentor and a leader, or whether that be return in your industry and be a uh, industry association uh, leader to lead an organization, or in your personal life and give back charitably or, or make your mark in, in the world. So maybe finally getting to the point where I'm moving into that return stage. And so I like trying to share and, and help others. But I kind of like that because wherever you are in your career, you can be in one of those categories and, and be thinking about the next one. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Jordan, thanks for having me on.